that. Can you all hear me okay if I talk like this? Okay, great. Uh, so my name is Josh, uh, Josh Koenig, Josh K. Um, I'm here to talk about my uh, vision for Drupal's destiny. So I'm really grateful that the, the uh, they put me on the core conversations track to do this. Um, I've given this a version of this talk a few different times at different uh, camps, um, starting at uh, Drupal, Drupal Camp Dallas last summer. So it's been almost a year I've been kind of tooling this thing around. Um, and I've uh, sharpened the presentation slightly because we have a we're in a core conversation and there's a bit less of a rah rah Drupal and a little bit more of a specific call to action about like let's get this thing um, rocking and rolling. Uh, but hopefully you'll appreciate where I'm coming from and then I'm happy to take questions at the end and hopefully this is exciting and motivating for all of you to do more and better things with our favorite content management system. So. Um, I got started in Drupal because I was trying to take over the government. Um, that's the scope at which I like to, th to sort of think, and that frames the, the ambitions that I have for Drupal as a project. And what I mean by that was I was living in New York City in uh, 2002, 2003, and uh, trying to agitate against the notion of having this war that we ended up having. Um, so I was doing a lot of hippie stuff, getting in the streets, holding up signs, having like uh, uh, gatherings of people to, to talk about that. And it, it totally didn't work. Um, it was absolutely, utterly ineffective. And, um, and we realized that was because the people in charge did not care. Um, and we believed then, or I reached the conclusion, that maybe if we changed who the people in charge were, we would have people who might care and listen to our concerns. And so I got involved in presidential politics. Um, I discovered this candidate, who was uh, sort of a dark horse, no-name guy from Vermont, um, because somebody put some videos of him on the internet, and he said some things that I really agreed with, like crazy communist things, like let's not go to war and let's have universal health care and let's have marriage equality, that now seem like total no-brainers, but at the time were verging on heresy. Um, and the internet sort of chose this guy. Uh, he was not tech savvy. His staff was not initially particularly tech savvy. They were simply willing to take a chance. Um, they started blogging. Um, that brought them uh, and that got their positions out there more widely. There was a constituency online that embraced those positions and wanted to help. And what started to happen was uh, a very, very exciting feedback loop of grass grassroots enthusiasm um, small dollar donations to actually help the campaign grow and professionalize and continued use of the internet to amplify the message and uh, and do outreach and it actually really worked this guy went from being an asterisk and who was supposed to be a no, no name also ran no compete person that nobody remembers to at for a while being the front runner to get the nomination to go up against uh, senior Bush in 2004 um, and uh, I got involved in this campaign first just as a supporter, as somebody who said, like, yeah, I like this. But then I realized this internet thing was happening, and I thought to myself, well, my like, sort of real-world meat space activism skills are at best B+. Plus. Right, and but my internet skills are pretty much A grade, so I could do a more valuable thing for this campaign than getting people to sign a petition. I could work on the internet side and try to help them be smarter and more effective with how they use the internet. And I went to a website uh, that I found called Hack for Dean that said, "Internet professionals of the world unite! We cannot wait for this campaign to give us direction. We just have to do stuff for them. Let's make awesome stuff." and uh, joined a mailing list, and over that summer we sort of hashed out uh, what we wanted to do. We eventually decided that the, the thing to provide was campaign in a box software for all the affinity groups to have their own web presences. We rechristened ourselves as Dean Space because hack sounds scary to the uninitiated and we didn't want to generate bad press. Um, and we picked up a very early version of Drupal. Uh, it was a Drupal 4.1, I believe. Um, that was when the slogan was uh, community plumbing, and that's what we wanted. We didn't want to build this thing from scratch, but we wanted to be able to deliver a pretty high-quality, community-oriented website that had things like RSS feeds and blogs and other stuff so that all the different affinity groups that were springing up, you know, teachers for Dean, pilots for Dean, Idahoans for Dean, so that they could all have a web presence and have a voice in this campaign and be part of this movement. And it was a total success. Um, we ended up with several hundred different affinity groups. The campaign itself officially picked up the software um, and was using it to run state-level campaign operations. And it was a, a, a pretty exciting thing. What we actually had built was a very, very primitive installation profile where you downloaded our tarball, which was Drupal plus a bunch of modules, and then you loaded this blank SQL file that populated it with settings and content so that when you actually booted it, it was like a real website and not a blank Drupal. Unfortunately, the campaign did not work out. It was a, uh, uh, 
it got a, had a lot more uh, mojo, in my opinion, than the anti-war organizing. But it was it failed in rather spectacular fashion when we failed to do what we thought we would do in Iowa. And then this guy was on 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 the mic, and Mike was a little hot. And then they just buried him. Um, so that was very sad. It was actually kind of heartbreaking, uh, and um, kind of bummed me out for quite a while. But we kept going. The experience we had as a group of people who had come together to work on this project and seeing there's one thing to believe that the internet can change the world and then there's another thing to see people use the internet to make a pretty major dent in what is one of the most change resistant systems that we have aka politics um, that was pretty magical and you saw things move really fast and change really quickly and opportunities emerge very fast and it was a, a very very intoxicating and empowering experience and even though it ended in tragedy and heartbreak for me I'm still very glad to have been a part of that and most of the people that were involved some people totally burned out and like never want to talk about any of this ever again uh, but a lot of people decided they wanted to keep going and so we created, uh, we turned the, the tech that was Dean Space into civic space. Um, and it became more of a transparent thing that was built on top of Drupal. And my, um, uh, the sort of founder of this project was my friend Zach, who I had met. He was the guy who set up Hack for Dean originally as a 19 year old kid on summer vacation. And we got, um, we got Neil Drum hired to work on Civic Space. He had been a campaign guy, and he ended up going on to manage the Drupal 5.0 release and now works for the association. Uh, and that's just me weighing a lot less. Um, but we basically retooled everything we had done for, specifically for the Dean campaign to be a campaign agnostic, any cause, any organization. Look, if you're a nonprofit, you shouldn't be um, you know, sending money into this proprietary system that's just bleeding you dry and taking you know, a vig off your donations. There's a, we used to call it Don Convio, because they really, they, like, they kind of had you by the balls. They, were like, they had all your contact records, all your donors, all your content, and we wanted to push this idea of open source into the world of do good nonprofit profits and causes, which uh, ironically had not really embraced that at that point. And we were pretty successful with, with Civic Space. Um, we put up a nice website that explained what it did in like terms that those organizations understood. They started using it, and then they would find out after the fact that really what they had gotten was something called Drupal, and then they needed to hire Drupal developers to improve their websites and add extra features and help seed some of the early marketplace um, for professional Drupal work through this project, which was fun. Um, we did other fun things, like we made bike jerseys. We love Drupal. Um, we eventually met this guy, Matt Cheney, a.k.a. The Populist. Um, and he had been a friend of Zach and Neil's at college. And together with Cheney, we thought we would go professional. Because Civic Space never got a, a sustainable uh, revenue stream. It was like essentially a grant that eventually ran out. And we never figured out how to get more, f like the whole how do you fund core development thing what happened to, to Civic Space and it petered out after the grant money ran out. So we thought, well, our friends have started companies and it's working out for them now to be professional Drupalists. Let's do that too. So we started this company called Chapter 3. Um, this is now on their old website. The new website's super sexy. Um, and uh, this, I actually should choose whether I chose the most recent website or the original one, which was designed by my mom. Um, <laughs> But it was exciting, you know, the three of us got together, we're going to be entrepreneurs, we're going to turn the Drupal dream into our livelihood, we're not going to work for the man, we're going to do the things that we want to do. And that was, that was a lot of fun, very exciting. Through the further work that we did on Chapter 3, I met this guy, David Strauss, who's the, the originator of Pressflow and, and sort of an all-around genius. Um, and we worked together on a couple of bigger projects that we were getting into towards the end of my t tenure at Chapter 3. And then we decided to fire ourselves from consulting and start Pantheon, which is designed to be the platform that solves a lot of the like, infrastructure and actual real plumbing problems that bedevil Drupal sites. And so I say all this to give you just preference on my perspective on the market and, and how I think about things. I like being an entrepreneur. I like being in control of my own destiny. I like creating things. I like to be able to innovate. Um, that's very gratifying. I like winning. Um, I'll be honest, like winning is a lot more fun than losing. I've had the experience of losing very badly in, in terrible circumstances. And while you do learn more from losing, the experience of winning is preferable. Um, <laughs> But more than that, I really, really like being a part of something bigger than myself. And I think that's something that's innate um, in human nature, is the desire to be a part of something larger than oneself. Actually, I think this is part of a, a, a psychological model that I find very useful. It's Maslow's Hierarchy of Human Needs, which if you're not familiar with it, is basically a way of saying, as human beings, we have a set of needs, and you can only address the higher level needs once lower level needs are taken care of. Or conversely, once you have the lower level things, your problem moves up to the next level. So you have your physiological needs, right? If you can't eat or you have no air to breathe, that's pretty much the only thing you're going to think about until you have those things taken care of. Then you need your safety, which is a little bit more like, 
where how will I eat tomorrow? You know, am I secure? Do I need to you know watch my back? And if you feel like you're under attack or under threat, or you don't know where you you don't know where your next meal is going to come from or your next paycheck, um, that's kind of the only thing that's going to be on your mind. Assuming that you know we we are lucky enough to live in a first world country, and in Asados Unidos, most of us have our physiological needs met and feel relatively safe. We then move on to our social needs, which everyone remembers from grade school and high school, which is you want to be part of a group. Right? And people will actually often pick being the picked on lowest like, status member of a group to being totally alone because that's at least some social, social needs are being met there. And that's sort of a common thing in people. We're social creatures. But even better than being the picked on member of a group, you would like to have esteem. You would like to be a peer of people. You would like to have respect. You would like to have good relationships with your friends and your family and your colleagues. And assuming that you're a lucky enough person, and actually most of us fall down somewhere in, in the second and third levels, to be honest, or, or third, and, third and fourth levels. Assuming you have all of these things met, um, and you're a very lucky and blessed person, you then can ponder the wonderful uh, problems of self-actualization, which is really Maslow's way of saying, you know, what is the meaning of life? Like, why are we here? Yes. We are here to actualize ourselves. And, and he says, you know, people find this through creative outlets, um, through their spiritual quests, through art, um, through helping other people in many ways. And that's kind of where the peak of human experience is really at. The best times you will have in your life are times when you are being self-actualized or helping others become self-actualized. I believe that the Internet can benefit humanity, and I find my own self-actualization through the exercise of this belief. Um, and that's kind of where I see Drupal fitting in. And to me, to me, Drupal's destiny is to pursue and uh, continue along this path. I think there's a lot of great technical stuff that we'll do, and I think there's a lot of great uh, specific use cases that we'll enable that are also extremely exciting. But those things are exciting to me not because they're in and of themselves cool. They're cool because I think they benefit humanity, and they're going to change the way the world works. I think that the Internet, properly executed, which is by no means a given, can lead us to a new renaissance. If you look back at history, every time that information has become easier to access and share, and people have been able to generate more dialogue around the quest of understanding one another and the world around them, we've seen great leaps in what is commonly called progress. Um, standards of living tend to go up, uh, science tends to advance, um, people die of less terrible diseases, and people have more fun. Um, so the Renaissance was a pretty cool time. This is a little Western-centric, but you get where I'm coming from. There was the Dark Ages, and there was, then there was the Renaissance. And that was really all driven by people lightening up about like, printing information and like, the church kind of losing some of its authority, and there being more diversity in what's going on. Um, and that's all what led to the Renaissance. Um, who here recognizes this photo? Okay, so pretty much everybody. I'm going to use this as, a, as an example. And this is actually super appropriate given the Dries note, because he was all talking about photography. Um, in the, um, in order to, for us to know about this photo, an enormous number of things had to happen. First of all, a highly trained professional had to have a highly specialized piece of equipment and be in the right place at the right time, like leaning out of his hotel room window to capture this shot. And then he had to hide the film in his toilet tank um, to be able to smuggle it out of the country. And then he had to bring it to a photo editor at a major newspaper, which is like a globe-spanning, gigantic organization that then had to develop the photos and review them and look at them and select this one and decide, okay, we'll publish it. And they would take that out to a printing press, right, or whatever other machinery they had at hand. And then they would use that to impress this image upon millions of pieces of thin, crappy paper so that it could get in front of everyone's face. And this is relatively recent. This was like in the 80s. And that's what you had to do to get an image like that out there. Yeah, you could also beam it around the world on TV. And if you think about how complicated that is for people to actually do, it's a lot of work. And the point is that in order for us to know things about interesting moments in time, there had to be an enormously complex and, and fairly brittle set of interchanges of information to be able to get this kind of thing out. And it wasn't it certainly wasn't in any way global. If you go and take this photo to the country of China and show it to people, no one will know what it is. Because at the time, they were able to say, we don't want that here. Let's not have that information. Um, that's, they still do that to a much less degree, but it's a lot harder for them to do now. Um, and so today, we live in a very different world where everyone has a compatible device in their pocket that could take the next one of these photos and they're able to instantaneously share it around the world. We become a world effectively that is able to witness itself in real time and process that information. That is the raw capability of what the internet lets us do and it opens up wonderful, wonderful possibilities for what can be done. Of course, this is how it's used most frequently. 
Um, and I think that a lot of people say that, you know, um, uh, you know, when you make these big, bold predictions, you know, you're kind of just being idealistic or naive because you look at what people actually do with their cameras, they're just out there taking selfies and, and who cares, right? And, and I think that while there's a truth to that, it is not a very valid critique because when you open up the realm of participation to a much, much, much wider audience of people, like in one era, professional photojournalists, and in another area, era, everyone with a camera, I mean, obviously you're going to get a lot more mediocre content. That's just to be expected. But the point is that at the top end of that most valuable, most important content, there's going to be exponentially more of it. And you can't just get distracted by the mediocre stuff. Besides, people have fun with their cameras. It's okay. The point is that fail will happen with or without the internet. And pointing out things on the internet that are failures is most often when you see skeptics do this, what they're doing is just pointing out something that was happening all along that you just didn't know about, right? People would sit there in front of the mirror for hours trying to get themselves to look right. Now they just do it with a photo, and so the internet has to see. Um, there's another uh, uh, counter argument about the internet, which uh, this guy, Elon Musk, who I have some amount of respect for because you know, he took all of his money and put it down on solar power, electric cars, and rockets, which is like, <laughs> that's a pretty baller portfolio. Um, and he was at a conference um, last fall, and he was sort of calling out uh, Silicon Valley software startups and stuff and being like, you guys are just a bunch of punks. Right? I'm here like trying to get us to Mars and like, getting electric cars and putting up the solar power cells, and you're just like, oh, that's the latest app. And that's not very cool. Um, and I think that there's some validity to that critique. But I also think that that critique, and, and there are certainly a lot of people who waste a bunch of time and money on stupid apps, don't get me wrong. But I think that there's um, that critique um, belies or misunderstands the fundamental role that the internet and the web in particular, I think, has to play in making other things possible, like actually delivering on all these things. Um, and I actually think, you know, Ben Franklin is cooler. Elon Musk is cool. Ben Franklin is cooler. And we have this idea, oh, whoops, uh, we have this idea that, uh, and it's, it's a truism, a cliche that's out there, that the, the internet is equivalent to the printing press in terms of its kind of impact on, on how we live and what we do and everything else. And I think that that's, it's not exactly right for reasons I'll get into, but it's sort of right. Um, and that gets back to that whole renaissance effect. In addition to like the political loosenings, the, one of the things that drove the renaissance was the widespread ability to reproduce information so that you could get books. They didn't have to be written by hand by monks to get another copy out. You could actually press them and print them. And that really drove uh, democratization of knowledge. And, and, and you know, Ben Franklin, movable type, took that to the next level. Um, and that's something that we're doing. We are actually doing that. Um, and we're, we're changing the way that people share this information. And all of these big names you hear in the internet industry, they all actually just point back to websites. Um, this is very simpatico with, with the Dries note, right? The Google is nothing without all the content to index and search. Um, Twitter is you, maybe something, but it, like without the ability to link to something and share cool stuff, it's not as useful. It's not as exciting. Um, Pinterest and Reddit would have almost no purpose if you couldn't link to the content behind them that, that people want. And so websites are really, we are the fertile, fertile organic soil on which all this other internet activity happens. Um, and that's, you know, we're the base for everything else that, that goes on. Because there's got to be a there there um, in order for, for the, the internet to be valuable, to be interesting even, let alone valuable. Um, and that's what we do. We are the printing press of the modern era. We are making the there there. Um, I think it's actually, in, in certain ways, we are more revolutionary than the printing press because the printing press was, although it democratized things by you know, making it way faster to reproduce information, it was also ultimately a broadcast media. You would have a person who would write a book and a person who would read a book. And that's a lot like um, the person who would be on the radio and someone who would listen to the radio, somebody who would be on TV, somebody who would watch TV. Broadcast media has been incredibly powerful, but also has been really <laughs> misused in a lot of ways. Uh, which is kind of unfortunate. And it's not as, as empowering as what we're doing, which is a networked media. The internet is inherently a two-way system. All of our interfaces with it are at least potentially bi-directional. And therefore, the types of interactions that we can have online are very different than the types of interactions you can have with a newspaper or a radio program or a movie. Um, Drupal is a mashup machine. It, 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 Drupal as software really, really most effectively takes advantage of this bi-directional, multi-directional nature, really, of the internet by allowing you to bring different data sources together. And it's been this way for a while. I just found this old slide from a presentation Zach did in the days of civic space. Um, but it's the idea of pulling in data from multiple sources, including your users, and creating something new out of it. 
Um, that's something that our software that we all work on does very, very well. It could always do it much better, but it's, uh, it, it is head and shoulders above all the other software that's out there. And that's something that I think is in the DNA of Drupal. It is in the essence of why we work together so well as a community, because the software that we're making is about bringing things together and making connections. That's why we have the awesome data modeling tools. That's why we have the whole views thing. That's why the next version of our, our software has REST, RESTful web services built into its core, because this is what we do. We're actually not just a printing press. We're not just cranking out pages. We're actually helping people connect, helping different information sources connect. And that's very different and very powerful. The, the medium is the message. It's like the Marshall McLuhan thing. And in the sense that the website is actually the medium in which most people will engage with the internet, Drupal most embodies that message because it is inherently down to its DNA a multi-dimensional, multi-interactive uh, system. Hetty. So now I'm going to take a, a slightly different track and talk about the web as an industry for a second, and we can talk about Drupal's place in that. So uh, in the United States, $500 billion are spent every year on digital marketing. Um, that's a pretty good-sized chunk of money. It's about as much money as Walmart makes every year, but it's a lot, right? It's a pretty big industry. Um, and $106 billion of it is really spent in what is classically uh, classified as online advertising. And that is all the revenue for Google, Facebook, Twitter, et cetera. That's where all of this is this slice of the pie is all, almost like 90 to 95 percent of the money that they make because they just are selling ads online and they're very good at it. Um, 130 billion dollars of it is spent on websites, which actually is more. And that makes sense because if you think about it, without the website, what are you advertising? Um, how many of you guys have worked on uh, website projects uh, you know, for several months where someone spent over $10,000 on building their website? Right, so a lot of people. How many of those projects had sizable advertising budgets behind them after they launched? Like a couple, right? So there's tons and tons of great websites that get built, built that don't even roll into the advertising equation at all. They're just like, I'll get this up there and I'll SEO it and that'll be enough. And it works, it's good. But if you think about it, it makes sense that all of this stuff, the money that goes into the advertising is actually less than the money that goes into the websites. Again, we are the basis on which all this other stuff operates, duh. Um, here's the CMS market, right? Um, these are the tools that we use to make websites. Um, by volume, WordPress is re leading, in fact, kind of running away with the CMS market. They're up over 20% now, um, just by volume. Numbers of, of domains and sites surveyed. There are a lot of WordPress sites out there. There are a fair number of Joomla sites out there still, although they're, they're actually in a little bit of a decline. And then there's a lot of Drupal sites, and then there's a bunch of other things that are out there too. And this long tail goes on forever. There's like a, a long tail that goes out to like, it's the 50th or 60th name, and you're still at something like 0.1% of the internet. Um, one of the big takeaways from this is that open source is totally winning this. Um, there are uh, almost no proprietary systems that have any significant market share at all. Um, the big enterprise systems, they, they probably make a fair amount of money, but they only power a handful of actual websites. And the, the proprietary site building tools, there are a few of them that are up and comers, but they're still in that kind of 0.1, 0 0.2% range of, of the map. They're, they're, they're orders of magnitude away from where the open source, primarily LAMP stack based tools are in terms of driving this. Like we, the, the tools that we make are the ones that drive the web. Um, Here's just a breakdown of the market leaders so you can see Blogger is like the only proprietary system with much traction and that's because it's like a software as a service thing that's really easy to use and it, and it got a lot of uh, attention a while back. Um, if you look at just the top 10,000 sites, you can see Drupal is a much stronger second. Um, uh, uh, Joomla doesn't play there as much. Um, then there's some other, but there's a, 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 a lie in the graph that I was showing you, um, which is I was admitting the true market leader the true market leader on the web is none. Um, so none means no detectable signature of any content management system. Um, so of the people in the room, how many, raise your hand if you're, if you're like a developer, like you've written, you write some PHP code. Okay, so, so most of you. So prior to doing work with Drupal, did you write your own content management system of some sort? Raise your hand. So everybody. Um, so none. None is all of that. None is, is all of the static sites. None is everything that just can't, it's like people who just put things up there. So, uh, or none is probably also all the different things that are real tools but didn't make like the, at a certain point they stopped calculating at for around a few hundred 
uh, different technologies. So the point is that there's a lot of the internet is just built on kind of whatever. And when people come around to launch a new website or they go to redesign their existing website, they don't relaunch it once again on whatever. They're going to pick up one of the more modern tools like the ones that we build to use. And so the true, the true um, if you want to think about market competition, the true competitor that we're up against in the war to make a better web is none. It's just getting people to use tools in the first place. And I think that we can win that battle. We're winning that battle. We just got to keep working on it. Um, in my book, for Drupal, winning would be getting up to a double-digit percentage there. I think that I don't know that we're going to be the biggest, uh, but I think we can be big and important um, and have longevity at that level and be a really, really great platform for the web. Um, and I think it's important for Drupal to be a winner. Um, it's not simply because I identify with Drupal and I want my tribe to win. It's because I do deeply believe that there is something special about the Drupal project, that it has this destiny to help us realize the potential for a renaissance driven by the internet. And I think that more than just being the printing press, the thing that cranks out pages for the web, uh, Drupal is a way for us to have a different way of organizing and thinking and working together and interacting together. You know, this, this concept of experiences, it's not just about like, hey, Glass, buy me this jacket. It's about how we, how we interact with one another as human beings all around the world. And that Drupal has the potential to really, really help change that and drive that and improve that. And it's more than just cranking out pages. So what will it take, in my opinion, for us to succeed, at least in the short term? Um, I think we're in, a, we're in an interesting point with, uh, with Drupal 8 just on the cusp. Um, I think it takes volumes of people. One of the, this is an advantage that we have, by the way. We're doing pretty good on this front. But for any technology to really get to that point of being a double-digit percentage of the, of the Internet, you need, like, mil literally millions of people that know how to use it and at least hundreds of thousands of people that can service it and support it. Because no technology gets, gets to widespread adoption without a huge ecosystem of people behind it. Um, you know, even Apple, though they, they stand front and center in front of all their technology and brands, how many people, how many people in this room when they were younger maybe made, like earned money on the side by helping other people how to set up their Apple stuff? Anybody? I did that in college. I don't know. So like, we're all there supporting Apple when we do that, even if we're not an Apple authorized reseller. It was going to take a lot of people for Drupal to succeed. It's also going to take Drupal making the leap to these types of devices because the adoption curve on these things is crazy and it's not going back. Right? The, the, the more and more and more and more of people's interactions th through the web are going to be driven through not laptops but phones and tablets. And I don't expect that trend to actually reverse at any time. Um, and we're going to need to, this is not that we need to adopt Git, but I, I look at GitHub and its relationship to Git, and I think that there's a need for more things that can do for Drupal what GitHub did for Git. So if you think about it, I think there's some interesting analogies. Um, Git is a very powerful tool. Um, it's also not straightforward to figure out how to use it. Um, it will openly mock you if you use it incorrectly. And it causes lots and lots of frustration if you're not doing it right. And for a long time, it was really just confined to people that already were experts in it and already understood it because they had they'd spent the time to learn it or they were kernel hacking or whatever. And everybody else was like, yeah, these guys keep raving about Git, but I can't figure it out. I mean, SVN works for me. Um, and then the GitHub came along and said, oh, let's make this actually really easy. Let's make this very straightforward to get started. Let's help you learn the way to do it. And let's like, make it easy to collaborate and take away some of the other pain points of actually using this productively. And boom, amazing, amazing results. And I, I don't think it's just as simple as like hosted Drupal, because obviously that's not the answer. But it's paradigmatically ways to make Drupal more easily graspable for people, but not just in a way that like they don't ever have to see the, the, the powerful parts. It's just so that they're not confronted with like the business end of the chainsaw first. Um, so I think on the people front, as I said, that's an advantage. We have a lot of people. That's really good. So keep telling your friends to get into Drupal because it's where it's at. Um, we also are good at training. We've got a lot of books out there so we can make new people uh, just by promoting our information. We're using printing presses to our advantage too. Um, we also have this wonderful professional services ecosystem. This is also very important. The businesses behind a technology help make that technology viable and help contribute to its future development. Um, and we have PHP on our side. Um, PHP is, a very, is the most widely used uh, language on the internet. There are lots and lots of people who know PHP who don't yet know Drupal but could know Drupal pretty easily. PHP is also going through a renaissance of its own, as I've been trying to say, hashtag PHP renaissance. Um, <laughs> 
and uh, and that 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 like honestly PHP the core of the PHP project has become a much more functional uh, community and has been getting out regular releases and other people have been lining up to support PHP and uh, putting resources into it. Facebook is really standing behind PHP, which I think has been a major boon. Um, as I presented earlier this morning with David, there's some really great performance enhancements coming th with PHP. So. Don't, don't take it. When people look down their nose at you because you work in PHP, you don't have to take that kind of crap from them anymore. <laughs> I think it's time we had some PHP pride. Um, yeah, PHP Renaissance. It's happening. And it's going to help us with Drupal. Um, but it's not all wine and roses. I think that we actually have some significant challenges ahead, in part because we're on the cusp of Drupal 8 and there's a lot of uncertainty. Um, if you look at Drupal's own publicly available metrics, even though we can pick out some stats that say things have been going really well for whatever time window, if you look at where we were between Drupal 6 and Drupal 7, we've definitely hit a plateau in terms of committers by month. Um, in terms of the activity on Drupal.org, um, the actual website itself that runs it, fewer nodes are being, maybe, and maybe that's because people are now let, posting less forum topics because there's Drupal answers or other things. I can't, you know, there, there's lots of ways to interpret this data, but I think that it's not wrong to sense that there's some unease in the community and there's a question about whether we're really going to make it and maybe we've plateaued and maybe we need to, to, to sort of uh, hit, hit some kind of new breakthrough. And I think that is true. Like we actually have to, grow more as a community and as a technology um, and it's incumbent upon all of us and not just doing core development it's really like popularizing Drupal making Drupal accessible showing people how to use it those are the things that really drive activity um, interest from the public over time this is Google Trends seems to be a little bit on the decline although I mean Ruby on Rails had a bigger hype bump and has fallen off to be down where we are and nobody says that Rails is dead. So again, I don't, I don't think this is doom and gloom, but I do think there is this sense where, for me personally, having been involved in Drupal at the very bottom end of that thing and felt it grow up through that whole curve, it definitely feels different now. And I, I'd like us to get some of that, get our mojo back around the Drupal 8 release. I think we really can. I think it'll be amazing. Um, and what can we do? What can we do to do that? Well. I think one of the, the best things we could all do as developers, as members of the Drupal community, especially around the release of Drupal 8, Drupal, uh, especially around the release of Drupal 8, because this is really hard to do in Drupal 7, is make the front end developers of the world, of the internet, really, really, really feel like they're first class members of our community. Um, because I think, thank you. Um, because people do the most crazy, amazing, awesome stuff in browsers now, and uh, that is, there's just so much innovation happening there. And we, uh, historically, have not been helpful for them <laughs> when looking to do that innovation on top of Drupal. So we, we did a few things early on that were smart, like we got on board with the jQuery train, but then we were unable to release, keep that version of jQuery up to date. And so at the very beginning, it was like, great, oh, jQuery, that's the new hotness. We can use that. And then a few years later, it was like, oh, I want to do this great jQuery information. Oh, I can't use Drupal for that. Um, and it's a real downer. And I think it's because, partly because it, it takes you know, real work to do this. There's a, you know, don't, don't look down your, don't be a PHP developer looking down your nose at a front end developer because they have a world of complexity and interesting stuff going on in their space too. And it's, it's complex to keep up with. And I think it also has to do with bringing those people into our community, being more welcoming, being more like honestly a little bit, I think we have some, some ground to make up here. So I would suggest that we should kind of, if there are, uh, I apologize if it blows the strategy if there are any front-end developers in the room, but I think we should be over-respectful to front-end people because I think we, we, oh, we, got, we have to make up ground with that community. I think we should go out of our way to make their lives better, to listen to their concerns, to try to make it so that they can do their next crazy awesome demo um, on Drupal instead of on some static site thing. Um, and I think that'll be huge for us. I think we can do it. I think we're already, with Drupal 8's moving in the right direction. We just have to get the community behind that idea that front-end development is first-class development, and I think we'll, we'll be golden. We'll reap benefits and rewards from that. Um, we also have to master the mobile equation. It's like way too hard right now to build great mobile websites, and everybody needs them. It's like no longer optional. You have to have a good mobile website. The use cases are evolving very quickly, and I think that... Um, as a community, what we can do around this is try to popularize best practices, try to think about it more, try to think about like actually using our phones and our development processes more. Um, this is different than what we've been doing historically. Over the past 15 years, you kind of been, you know, it was like, well, my big concern was, does it work in IE? And now it's it's actually, you know, the the browsers and phones are better than than IE used to be, like that whole thing. But um, 
but, uh, but they're also very different. And so you have to think about your use cases differently. And that's a challenge. And I think we actually have to make that a first class challenge in terms of what we do. Like the challenge of mobile is one that we must, must rise to and best. Um, and it's, it's, it sucks, right? The Drupal.org homepage is not a mobile website. It just shrinks everything down. And like, it's kind of usable, but it's not really like, it's not a mobile website. And I think we have to start putting our best foot forward. And hopefully that's actually gonna be part of the new redesign, which would be great. Um, because again, these numbers are going up and up and up and they're not, they're not going back. And if you look at how the, the amount of time people spend on there, don't be fooled by the way. People throw out all these benchmarks about how nobody uses the web on their phone and they're utterly misleading because what they do is they don't differentiate between the time spent looking at web content in the embedded browser in the Facebook app or the Twitter app. They only look at it when you launch the native browser. And so it says like, oh, only 10, 20% of time on phones is spent looking at the web browser when actually, and like 40% of it's on Facebook. In actuality, a good chunk of that 40% is also spent on the mobile web. And again, it gets back to that point where the websites are what everything boil back to. And so uh, don't, don't just think it's all apps because the mobile web is utterly important to the future. It's going to be totally key. Um, and then l lastly, of course, is our whole learning curve problem. Right? Uh, you guys probably are all seeing this graph, but I think it's funny, so I put it in there. Um, you know, we have this, uh, this kind of weird thing where Drupal is kind of sounds great, it's got a lot of great promises, but then you go and you try to get involved in it, and it sort of feels like this bridge to nowhere. You kind of feel like maybe there was like a bait and switch somewhere along the line, because I thought I was supposed to be empowered by the system, and instead it's making me feel stupid. Um, that's not a good experience, right? That's not a welcoming experience to other people that are trying to get and use our tools or become a part of our community. Um, this is not new either. This is a slide from Dries' presentation at the Open Source CMS Summit in Vancouver, British Columbia in 2006. It's old enough that Plone gets on the, um, the diagram. Um, but it's the same problem. Like richness is what are all the things that you can do? Or I should say also old enough that vignette rates on the diagram because who uses that? Uh, <laughs> It's, it's, you get richness, right? That what are the, what's the range of things you can do? And you get reach, which is how broadly can you be adopted and how big is your community? And, and it's interesting that he's a smart dude, right? He, pretty, he saw this, WordPress, Joomla, Drupal. And if you look at the current market share, it's WordPress, Joomla, Drupal. It's not a coincidence. Um, we can make our, we can improve the reach of Drupal you know, by building better technology, but I, a lot of it's also just explaining Drupal better. Better tutorials, like the Drupalize Me stuff is great, but I think we need more voices getting into, here's a really simple explanation of how you can have a total win with Drupal and get to an aha moment in like an hour. Uh, if we do that, we'll really improve the reach of the platform. And that's something that we can all contribute to as developers. Because Drupal is important, I agree, I hope I've maybe at least planted a seed for you to think about that, but it's also too hard and too expensive. Um, the hidden cost of open source software is that you age while you try to figure out how to use it. And it's just too hard. And that, that equates to expense, whether that's labor cost or just the fact that you don't have the time to invest in beating your head against something that feels arcane and difficult to use. We've got to improve that. Um, we've also got to improve the fact that there's all this infrastructure you've got to take care of, and obviously I'm, I'm deep into that. Um, and that's another layer of complexity I didn't talk about at all that really does hold back the adoption. Like WordPress.com is one of the reasons why WordPress is that huge. There's like 70, no, sorry, 17 million blogs on WordPress.com. And that's because you don't have to do anything to set it up. There's no, you don't have to like configure uh, Apache, you don't have to FTP your stuff anywhere. You just go, and so there's a lot of those, like probably at least 10 million of them are various degrees of abandonware, but it really helps with adoption when you can get the infrastructure out of the way and help people experience the software. And I think we think of Drupal very often in our own uh, uh, experience as developers, especially those who are we, we here, right? You're, you've already mastered it. Um, and we're like, it's like this beautiful building block system and I can just pile the functionality on top of each other and snap it together and create things that if you develop them from scratch would take months in a matter of an afternoon or maybe a weekend. And people hear that promise and they go and they kind of get on that bridge to nowhere and they're like, no, it's like this. Like, what, what's going on? You know, it's a huge mess and I'm stepping on things. <laughs> and, and if you think about it, this is not a great experience for people. Like, if all the Lego company did was sell you a giant plastic sack full of Legos like this, they would go out of business tomorrow because this is not a, this is not a great way to be introduced to something. That's why they sell Legos like this. Right? There's like a box on it, 
and it has a picture of what you're going to get. And you can be reasonably certain that everything you need to get the picture is in the box. And it says who's it's appropriate for. Like this one's for little kids, right? Maybe I don't want to buy that for my teenager or I don't want to buy the teenage Legos for my little kids, right? It helps you make a good decision right away and feel good about it and then have a successful experience with Legos. And then, and then actually I'm going to back up one. And after you get 10 kits and you end up with this because this is the most fun thing to play with. But that's not where you start. You start here. Um, and we can do better with that with Drupal. I've seen that work before. That was what I saw work with Civic Space was if you can give people an experience that gives them the immediate feeling of, oh, I understand what this is for. I am doing something productive now. Um, the rate of adoption you can get for that is much, much, much higher than the rate of adoption you can get for something that asks its first question of, well, what does content mean to you? It's a, it's a great question to ask, but it's a little bit inscrutable for the average layman. Um, and I think that there's a huge amount of potential for us to, to sort of productize Drupal uh, further. And uh, you know, installation profiles have been a, a maybe valuable, maybe just a marketing exercise thing for, for far too long. I think we kind of, in the era of Drupal 8, we'll either see this happen or we'll have missed the boat. And I hope we see it happen because it's really cool when it, when it works. Um, so to wrap up, um, don't be discouraged. Be excited. Um, the history-making part of the web is just beginning. Um, that's, I think, very important to keep in perspective. I've been doing this for like 20 years, so it, it feels like old hat to me a lot of the time. But it's important to remember that this is, we're early in the story of what all this means for the world. We're early in the story of what the internet actually does for people in their lives. And we're very early in the story of what it means for us as a species that lives on a giant rock that floats through space. We've got this mashup machine, but really what we want is something that helps us be better together. Um, there's so many better ways that we could live that can be mediated through information. It's impossible to overstate the scope of the activity here. We're just getting started. The whole world is really just getting started. We're, we're, we're so early. I'm going to show this, this little animated graph. This is from um, some uh, uh, World Bank data you can get from Google. Um, and I'm visualizing internet access up and GDP wealth. And it's going to animate through time. And play. And so here, we can see nobody has the internet, right? This is like the early 90s. And then people in Estados Unidos, they start to get the internet. And, uh, and then you know, other things are happening. Broad broadband efforts are going on. 2006, 2000, there's a little recession. And then you know, kind of here we are. The data only goes, goes up through 2012. Um, and the important thing to, re to, to, to take away from this is most of the people in the world are in the lower left. But they're moving up and eventually also out to the right. In the next 10 years, we will have 4 billion more people on the internet than we do now. 4 billion more people. That's 4, million, 4 billion more people who will be interested in interacting with one another, who will be interested in creating, who will be interested in connecting. And the potential of what's possible with that amount of people wired up to talk to each other and figure things out is just mind blowing. It's almost impossible to overstate the scope of the opportunity that we have, not just as Drupalists, but as human beings, to make a better world for all of us through this medium, which has these unique capabilities to empower and so on and so forth. It all, it's, it's not a done deal. Like, clearly, the internet can be used for evil, too. We have to guard against that. Um, but I believe that what we've seen historically is that technology becomes revolutionary when the technology itself begins to fade into the background. And we're just starting to see that here in, in the United States, and we'll, it'll take a while to see it in other places. But when the story is about the technology, it's just about the technology. And technology is disruptive, and it changes business models, and so on and so forth. But when the story ceases to be about the technology and what it is, and starts to be about what people are doing with the technology, right? When the story for Twitter is not, oh, Twitter did this, and the story is the Egyptian government was overthrown, which largely happened as a result of their ability to use social media to organize, that's where really, really powerful things start to happen that are very exciting. And this is going to change everything for all of us. And I'm really excited to be a part of that. And I'm really excited to be with you and be a part of that. And I thank you for taking your time out of your busy DrupalCon to listen to me rant. And I hope at least you got something worth thinking about out of this. If anybody has any questions, you can use the mic. Thanks, Josh. Um, so, is this on? Yeah, oh, it is. Okay. So, the disconnect that, that we find, um, I'm going to 
mention the higher ed space just because that's where I sure. happen to be, is that I have Drupal developers, we're good programmers, we could build whatever you want. We have departments who have kind of an old school business model maybe, and they want to be, they want to you know, bring themselves out. So the disconnect is, what do, what do we need to build? You know, who's going to come up with the idea of how to help the department or the, this part of the university or maybe the whole the university as a whole? Who comes up with that middle piece of being able to solve their problem because they're probably not coming up with it? We don't know enough about that industry or their particular department or their particular business to come up with it, though we can help. We can show them maybe some possibilities of what's available. So what, what's that middle piece right there? Well, I, mean, I, I think that's a really great question. And... Um I don't know. Um, my guess is that it, it requires someone to come from one side of the equation and move towards the other. And that could be someone from your side that is able to take the time um, and has the interest to like really just sit with the other people and really like take, uh, get in their heads and understand their problems. Or on the other side, it could be somebody who really knows the problems and is going to you know, come over to your side and be like, well, let, what, let, tell me more about the technology. How can we do this? Because you really do need a meeting of the minds at some point. Right. People who deeply feel and understand a problem space and people who deeply feel and understand tools before you can get an innovative solution. Uh, but it's not a third force. that I don't believe right. in that. I don't think something just swoops in from outside and is, solves it. And is that common for Drupal shops to get people, then pay them to go and be part of that or to get paid to be part to, to I don't, do that. I don't, I don't think that that's uh, overtly economically all that common, but it's certainly common for Drupal shops to spend a lot of time working with a particular industry or a particular mm -hmm. type of customer and get better and better and better and better at understanding their problems and solving them quicker, like more efficiently, more, more cost effectively over time. And I think, you know, that's like uh, a lot of this sort of like the civic space model was a vertical Right? That was like, we understood the problems of political organizing because we had just gotten done doing this crazy campaign. So we knew that we had an answer because we had lived it. Um, and I think that there are a lot of people in the Drupal uh, ecosystem who are getting to that level of knowledge about some vertical or another. And it's just a question of now, how do you turn that knowledge into something practical? Which we don't know. That, that's something we all have to work on. Thanks. Yep. Thanks, Josh. I think you make a very good and compelling argument for communication for social media, for open source, but th easily 95% of this talk you could give at a WordCamp or at a Joomla Dev Days and it would still apply. What makes Drupal special in this regard, aside from the fact that we're doing it and we're awesome? <laughs> that aside, yeah, yeah. what makes Drupal what makes Drupal special? Special, especially when we're not the market leader. Right. So uh, the, the the piece that I think that makes Drupal special is. The um, Drupal has the DNA of um, of interconnection. There are like plugins you can stick on top of WordPress to make it into a community site, and there are things you can do with Joomla, I'm sure, to do the same. And there are other forum softwares that don't rate in the um, in the in the top brand that are just there to like help people chatter with each other. I think that the to me that what makes Drupal special is that it's it has both a technical technical architecture that is incredibly um, apt for the challenge of bringing different data sources together and rationalizing them and regurgitating them, which then makes it very apt to solve the problem of connecting people and data. And it is driven by a community that has that same ethos. Um, and I'm not, and that's not to say that those other softwares don't also have great communities, but there is a difference in their ethos. Um, and I think that what makes Drupal special is that it in particular, I believe, embodies this... Um, connective and uh, networked nature of the internet that I think is so revolutionary. Um, there's certainly like revolutionary potential in just everyone having a blog too, and I don't want to discount that, but I think that there is something that, that I'm, I, and I, I, you're right to pick on this, because I don't think I ever, I fully articulated to my own satisfaction, but the specialness of Drupal is, like in the Dries note, the notion of Drupal as this hub, right, and it can it can have you have your users, you can have your administrators, you can have nine other different services, and then you can have 15 other things that you're sending data out to. That's something that only we really do. Like the other, any other, like you, if you want to do that and you don't want to use Drupal, you're probably writing it from scratch. And I think what the world needs is many, many, many more uh, applications that can serve that type of purpose. Follow up? Yeah. Uh, good answer, thank you. Uh, cool, thanks. <laughs> Uh, two quick questions, Josh. Yeah. Uh, one, do you see Pantheon as WordPress.com for Drupal 
and how does that play in with the fact that you now support WordPress? <laughs> and two, two, how what is Pantheon doing to uh, push designers and themers and front enders? Are you guys doing much to help with that? Yeah. Um, so the first first answer is a resounding no. Um, because we're we are by for and of developers, and WordPress.com is a is a consumer product, right? It's it's really for someone who can't get a developer. So we're very orthogonal to that. Um, and in terms of what we're doing to bring front end people to the equation, honestly, I want us to do so much more. Um, and and part of that is going to be able to put together documentation and tutorials. The one thing that we did was we made sure that even though we were building this very version control oriented like arcane platform that you could still get into the development environment and work there directly because that's how a lot of front end people prefer to work. But like every time I pass Sam Richards in the hallway, he's like, "Where's my SaaS support?" And I'm like, "Ah, oh, working on it." Um, so we have a long way to go. Um, hope that answers your question. Yes. Hi, uh, I love your analogy with Lego, yeah. and it's a really great uh, analogy for Drupal and Lego because you can buy a twenty-dollar piece for your three years old, or you also you can buy for four hundred dollars uh, Death Star uh, yeah. that you will be putting together for three months. Yeah, yeah, that's actually a but really good point too. I should work that into my next version. <laughs> it's open source, right? Yes, <laughs> it's totally. One thing I want to mention is that every single Lego set, even if it's like five pieces, like five dollar set, comes with illustrated manual. Yeah. I apologize. I know everybody would hate me for that, but documentation or Drupal dot org uh, somehow presumes that everybody knows everything. Mm -hmm. And I'm wondering if Drupal, not just as a community, but uh, it has to be somebody who says. This is effort that has been promoted to write documentation because I know lots of people who would be very happy to contribute documentation, but the process of doing it is so complicated mm -hmm. at this point yeah. that if something doesn't happen somewhat soon, people will begin going back to WordPress. Yeah, I think that this is something, I think I don't know for sure, but I know that the Drupal Association has been surveying people in terms of what can they do better. Um, and what, and particularly like things that relate to Drupal.org, I know one of the things that uh, several people have said, and I said to them was, <coughs> we should really, actually, probably have someone full time curating, improving, and editing our documentation because you are, there are a lot of people that want to contribute, but if all you have is like hundreds of different contributors, it's not coherent. There's lots of misconnections, and it assumes knowledge that isn't reasonable. And you need an editorial process that's not like difficult for people to engage in, but that's smart in order to solve that. So I hope that will happen. I, I think I agree with you that the documentation that's something we can all do better at, and we can all contribute to. So very good point. That's great. I hope that I hope it will happen uh, by the next Drupal con. You'll say, "See, it happened." Yeah. <laughs> Thank you. Of course. Now, this is the last question because we are out of time. I promise I would end on time. The, the, this is more of a comment, but I do want to hear your feedback um, regarding Larry's point. I feel like Drupal is special because of all of the things that you said. But like Larry said, there, I believe that there are a lot of other tools out there that can do it, and like there is beautiful code out there. We're getting to that point in Drupal eight. But I really feel that what's special about Drupal is that we're passing that power to site builders. It's, it's much easier for us to give a lot of power to site builders and people to become site builders than to train new, new developers to create these amazing things to connect people. So I've, I've, I feel that if we keep that perspective that we're passing that power on to people that are not developers.